Right, welcome everyone. It's time for the Friday lighting talks. Um, a couple of quick announcements to make before we get started. Um, someone lost some paper authentication or um, crypto credentials. Um, it's written on paper, so um, it, it was found. Uh, if this is yours, come speak to David or one of the other organizers um, and describe it or say where you lost it um, so you can recover it. If you carry any um, like credentials with you on paper and you may not be aware that you lost them, check that you still have them. If they're missing, um, come talk to us. Uh, cool. So without any further ado, on to the lightning talks. Um, first up, we have Bruce talking about async IO. Um, oh, and what we're going to do is, uh, it's the usual rules, five minutes. Um, if, you, if we get close to, the or close to the end of the five minutes, I'm going to get ready with this ball. When we hit five minutes, you get hit with the ball. And then you can keep talking for as long as you want to get pummeled with the balls. Um, and we'd encourage the audience, uh, when the five minutes is up, applause as well. And yeah. So let's get started. Let me just get my timer going here. And uh, five minutes. And you're up. It's on. Yeah. Hello? Right. So I'm going to be talking about asynchronous IO, but particularly about cancellation. So what is cancellation? Well, cancellation is what's going to happen in five minutes to my talk. Uh, so, if you've not seen async IO before, this is a very simple example of how you might write a server. So you've got some task that handles each connection as a reader and a writer, and it uses, this is Python 3.5 syntax, you do a blocking call, well, an uh, asynchronous call to read some data. If, you've, if, the connection, if the client's disconnected, you break out, and otherwise you asynchronously process whatever they've asked you to do and send them a response back. And then in the actual server side, uh, omitted some details, but there's this create task call, which says take this asynchronous function and kind of fork it off as a new task that's going to run in the background. And eventually you might want to join with that task again and get the result. Okay, but one of the things with any sort of asynchronous IO is it's a bit like drugs. It's easy to get started, but it's stopping that's hard. So when you want to shut down your server, uh, how do you break out of this loop? There's nothing in here that's checking to see if the server's stopped, and inside that function, there's definitely nothing to check that the server's been asked to stop. So what you do is you take that task object you've got and you say dot cancel. And this, I think, is one of the killer features in async IO compared to something particularly like Tornado, which I don't think has an equivalent to this. And what that does is it throws an exception back into your task when it gets resumed. So it'll actually go into possibly the internals of reader.readline, and then that'll bubble out with normal exception semantics, and eventually it'll bubble right out of this function and it kills off that task in a nice, clean way. And you can also catch the exception if you want to do some nice cleanup and tell the client that the server is shutting down or if I want to quickly start ducking to avoid these balls coming my way. And I would... S oh, yes, and this is also built into async IO in a nice way. Uh, if you use, say, this wait for thing with a timeout, when the timeout triggers, it will cancel the task that it's waiting on. So I would encourage you to think about this when you're writing tasks. Try and write your code to be cancellation safe, so that if your task is cancelled, it cleans up neatly after itself. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, our next talk is um, Simba, who's going to be talking about keeping your friends close and your caches closer.
Okay, cool. Um, okay, while we're sorting out the technical problems, uh, we have some t-shirts to give away from uh, last year. So, who here was at PyCon 2016 and didn't get a t-shirt? Anyone? Otherwise, who wants one? <laughs> Woo! High demand. Okay, well, let's chuck some. Are we going to make this a team effort? All right. I'll take the right side. Good question. Um, size. This is a large. Okay, and here we have a 2XL. There we go. Okay, there's a, here's a medium. Great, let's let's go close. Okay. <laughs> okay, and here's another large. Okay, I'm going to throw this as far as I can. Oh wow! Nice catch. <laughs> Woo. And an Excel. Oh. Okay. Okay, we have another Excel. And Excel. More Excels. Do we have any more mugs? Yeah. Okay, I think what we can do, um, does anybody have uh, a story? Oh, are we, are we good to go? Awesome. Great. Testing. Okay. Hello? Okay, cool. Uh, so, my name is Simba. I uh, work for Zappy Store as a developer. I've uh, been working on a uh, caching problem for a few months. That's why uh, cache rules everything around me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you guys about a uh, problem that we faced uh, and how the learnings that became, what that came out of uh, uh, the solutions that we came up with. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, We've got about 14 terabytes worth of Pandas data structures. So that's data frames, indices uh, that we serialize and store in MySQL for our data science computation engine. Um, and because of this, we've had to scale up vertically to a DB box, which has 10 GBPS worth of a network card to allow us to be able to transmit the data at the speed that the computation engine can tolerate. Uh, and one of, uh, we've got, well, three major clients and one of these accounts for about 80% of the data. And we got to the point where we were starting to hit capacities of what we can do uh, and how we can scale horizontally. So we thought about a solution um, to this problem and so typically, the kind of computation that we do or our computation model looks something like this. So let's say we want to do something like a weighted mean on uh, a data frame for students uh, on some marks. So basically, we have something like this, which is kind of uh, an expression tree that we evaluate uh, in Python. So basically, you have a data frame. You go and fetch all of its columns from um, MySQL, and we also store the metadata for the data frame in order to encode the metadata 
in the structure so that when we reconstruct the, uh, we, so that we're able to reconstruct the data frame uh, in memory. And then we can apply a group by on that and then you can do um, a weighted mean. Um, so what happens is to figure out whether the data has been cached before is we use the metadata. So we check whether the metadata exists. If it does, then we know that we can fetch the data from MySQL. If it's not there, then we know that we need to recalculate that particular calculation and then cache it uh, in MySQL. So going back to what our solution was supposed to be, our goal was to find something that is durable and has a larger capacity, something that is cost effective, uh, also ability to scale horizontally and be able to maintain the speed that we already had. Uh, and this is the solution that we came up with. So we've got a bunch of uh, worker boxes that run our computations. And on every worker box, we have a bunch of workers and what we call a cache worker on every box. So basically, uh, when data is retrieved from the database, uh, the cache worker will broadcast the fact that it's retrieved some particular data. It gossips this signal to all the other cache workers. Those cache workers check whether they have the data sitting in EBS volumes that are pointing to them. If they do, they just ignore the message. If they don't, then they fetch that data and uh, uh, serialize it on the EBS, uh, the EBS volume, which is uh, SSDs that front uh, the cache. Uh, and as far as also deleting, when you delete, we want this to be consistent. So when a deletion goes on, we broadcast that message and make sure that the deletion is consistent across all the distributed caches. Uh, so some learnings from this. Uh, solving the cache consistency problem was uh, quite uh, hectic. Um, but yeah, Redis was really helpful uh, as a messaging uh, protocol for that. Uh, consensus delete, making sure that date the end, there isn't any uh, data caches on disk. Uh, we had to also solve that using Redis. Another thing that we learned uh, was, so when one of these workers die, if you use the PubSub protocol for Redis, uh, you would lose this message. So rather than using PubSub for deletes, which are critical, we would rather use a queue. So if a worker dies, uh, another one will get uh, recreated. And... Uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right, so thank you for that. Uh, next up, we have Peter von Onselen who will be talking about something completely different. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, before we do that, uh, do we, do we still have some mugs to give away, right? Okay, so who's feeling brave? Does anybody want to uh, share a story or something cool that they learned or something cool that happened or a joke? Come up. Uh, do we have a mic? Here you go. Oh. A brief article I came across recently described how, how many of you use Slack within your workspace to communicate with each other? And how many of you have that Slack set up so that it automatically adds anyone who has an email address at your domain? Okay, because a lot of people do and apparently that's a bit of a security hole because one guy found out that a lot of ticket support systems, when you submit a ticket, they'll give you an address at their domain that then anything sent to this address turns up on the ticket. And he realized he could use this to sign up for their internal Slack <laughs> workroom without anybody figuring out. And support systems and all the internal communication. So, yes, be careful with who you allow into your Slack workspace. Thank you. 
so this is more of just a joke. Um, the funniest thing I've ever seen a junior developer do, or like the f funniest, the funniest bug I've ever seen, was uh, these guys came up to me and they're like, um, <clears throat> "Oh, we've done something bad. Can you come and have a look at the stack trace?" So I went to go over and look, and uh, it turned out they had refactored every case of the word users to the word refracted, and I had to not only explain to them that you don't refract a code by replacing every word with uh, refracted, but that it's <laughs> it's it's actually refacted and not refracted. Okay, hi. Um, so I was chatting earlier uh, last at the speaker's dinner with David, and he insisted I do a talk about this particular topic. Don't blame me. It's entirely your fault. You know it, so shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's been a wonderful conference. I thought I'd take a page out of Flavio's, pay, uh, Flavio's book and his talk on yesterday, where he said you have to own your own growth, and not all of it has to come from the tech, stat, uh, tech community. So with that in mind and that context, now for something completely different. Let's talk about fencing. <laughs> so fencing is the artful of uh, using a sword or a foil in the skillful attack or defense. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, mm, that's the thing where you wave fluffy things around, right? So yeah, that's fencing. And I'm not talking about this fencing. I'm not talking about those people who swing car aerials around as if they're feather dusters. No, I'm talking about this fencing. This is known as historical European martial arts, also known as HEMA. And notes. And this has been, whoa, what did I say? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so HEMA. And the point of HEMA is you're using big actual swords, like this big, huge long swords and etc. Um, you're using them to treat the weapon as if it is an actual sword and not basically a car aerial playing laser tag, which is what modern day sports fencing is pretty much about. And I get to use weapons like this. Cool big long swords, quarter staffs, halberds, pikes. It's a lot of fun. It really is. Um, so lots of cool weapons. Um, so here's the thing. This this entire movement is about trying to resurrect Europe's past. So European martial arts kind of died out entirely and there's no living history of it. And the reason there's no living history is because, let's be honest, guns work. <laughs> um, so there's no master teaching a student and the student becomes a master to teach the next student on how to actually use a halberd or a pike or a sword besides, you know, laser tag. And there's a whole bunch of, there's an entire movement trying to resurrect it. And the guy on the left is a guy named Roger Norlin. There's a whole big movement. It's been around since the 90s. What they do is they basically go back and read the old historical European masters' written manuals and treatises, which the European guys wrote a hell of a lot of. I mean, they, they literally have spent the last 1,000 years writing novel, uh, books and books and books of just lots of ways of how to fight with all these weapons. It's, um, it's astonishing how enthusiastic Europeans are about writing books, to be honest. Um, and what's quite interesting is you get an entire set of this history. So this over here, for example, is an entire martial system that was taught to cavalry officers, and it's an entire thing on a single page. But you're going, oh, that's a bunch of pictures. Let me show you what a local club is doing. And I purposely turned off the sound on this video because it just weirds me out. So I, I can fill in commentary. Oh, narrate. Yeah, so um, it's persons are hitting each other, apparently. <laughs> um, so what you'll find is they're using three different types of weapons here. There's going to be steel, which is an actual steel longsword. And yes, we are, uh, we are hitting each other with it. And we're using synthetic plastic weapons and we're using foam weapons. And the idea here is to be able to learn the techniques, apply the techniques, and then do it under pressure, and do it repeatedly. 
It's a lot of fun, but crazy. <laughs> I, I, I'm sensing a lot of doubt here. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's, that's perfectly fine. Come. You're welcome to join us. Literally, this happens at far... Uh, there's a scout hall right next to Fari's. Mondays. Uh, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times I've had to work with no pinky because it's damaged. And this is through gloves that are like plate gloves. It's ridiculous. Um, steel, not rattan. Also, historical techniques. And I'm running away from the podium now. Thank you very much. All right, so next up we have Simon Cross, who's going to be talking about the Python Software Society of South Africa which is a really cool development. Oh, did someone lose their phone? Hello? Cool. So, um, PyCon today has kind of grown up, um, and that's meant that it's time for some grown up things. And one of those grown up things is the uh, Python Software Society of South Africa. Um, and one of the problems is that that's a mouthful. Um, this may be the most boring lightning talk you're ever going to hear <laughs> because it's all about organizations and legal stuff and money um, which is why I made it more exciting by writing the slides as a bulletin board service which I'm going to turn it into <laughs> um, so first just some some general stuff um, its name is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we chose it to be clear, accurate, and unique. Um, yes. So um, if you have a if you have a good acronym for us to use, we're currently going with PSA. <laughs> 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 um, <coughs> started in May this year, and it's a non-profit company. And according to the uh, to SARS and the South African Registry of Businesses, its status is in business. Uh, so so why did we make this thing? Um, so first of all, it's for supporting and growing um, the community of Python software developers in South Africa. So that's you and all of the people who would like to be like you, i.e. be Python developers, but aren't yet. Um, supporting and managing the running of PyCon. So probably the primary and like biggest driver around this is we actually need a company behind PyCon now because we're spending like kind of half a million rand running the conference and that money has to go through somewhere. Um, Supporting and managing other Python software community events within South Africa. So if you're running something Python related, whether it be like Python for everyone or machine learning, um, uh, and you need some of the services of the Python Software Society of South Africa, um, let us know. Um, we also broadened the scope quite a bit. Um, so we're allowed to provide funds to individuals who otherwise would not be able to attend some sort of event. Um, we can support activities of individuals who are doing very broadly worded things like enhancing the visibility, health, or public image of the Python software developers in South Africa. And we can also support groups who are growing the community of Python software developers in South Africa. Cool. Um, so what kind of, whoops, sorry, two. Uh, what kind of things can it do for you? If you're organizing something Python related in South Africa, and it can receive and hold money or other assets for you. It can pay suppliers for you. It can help you with infrastructure. We can't give you money yet, but we might be able to give small amounts of money in the future. Um, that's just because we currently don't really have any money. Um, <laughs> um, and it could form working groups. Um, I'm actually going to skip structure for time because we've largely covered that. It's a non-profit company. Um, 
there are three directors. Um, so that's me, David, and Neil. And <laughs> can I subtract time for clapping? <laughs> Um, so there's two immediate problems with that. The one is we're all white dudes. Um, so if you're not a white dude, you're the people who can directly help fix that. I can only stand up here and say stuff. Um, if you want to become a director, it's going to be a journey. Start by organizing events and just engaging w with us. Um, and we do really want to rotate this group of directors because the other problem is that in five years' time, me, Neil, and David are going to be sick of running this thing and <laughs> we're going to want anyone else to step up. <laughs> um, so get, get involved now so that in three years' time you can be a director. And that's it. Uh, the code for this is on GitHub. Thank you very much, Simon. All right, so next up we have Whitney Tennant, who's going to talk about why she keeps flying to Cape Town for sandwiches. Hello. Uh, so <clears throat> I got started thinking about this talk after reading a Reddit thread, uh, which was about bribery. And uh, what I learned from reading this, what the takeaway was, was that um, bribing people with money and with something else is much more effective than just bribing them with money. Um, so we're all motivated by more than just money. Um, essentially, working for a company means that you're bartering your time and your brains for money. Uh, but there's a spectacular range of things uh, that can make you happy and that help determine the avenue that you choose to, to get that money. So in my case, I, uh, I wanted to learn a lot. So I wanted to be part of a development team and be surrounded by really experienced developers. Uh, I think as developers, we're, we're motivated by challenges and solving puzzles and vanquishing problems. Being in a team usually means that you can do those kinds of things faster and better. Uh, but last year, I worked remotely they decided to hire me even though they knew I was going to be living in another city. And so I spent two weeks in the office and then I was gone. So uh, I found it really, really, really tricky. And um, it was tricky for a number of reasons. The first one was that I'd never worked on such a large code base before. Um, I'd, only, I'd worked at an agency before where everything was written, you know, sort of out the box. I could go into Stack Overflow and find it, exactly what I needed. And these problems were, you know, I, I didn't know what in God's name an IBT was or how on earth our logistics worked or, or anything. Uh, so there was also only about six developers uh, when I joined. So everything was sort of breakneck speed and nobody really had time to deal with this random Sputnik on Slack. Um, so w the net result was that I ended up feeling really um, isolated and uh, I... I <laughs> I started interpreting uh, people's not responding to me on Slack uh, in a very negative way. And um, <clears throat> it sort of fed, all these negative thoughts fed into like this imposter syndrome. And I quickly became a very, very sad developer. Uh, I think some of the time developers don't always realize how intimidating they are. Because uh, you're, you're very stressed usually and very smart. And the combination is <laughs> sometimes quite intimidating. So uh, what happened was I used to fly to Cape Town for lunch a very expensive lunch, but it used to make me feel a whole lot better. Uh, so when I was suddenly around my teammates, I realized that a lot of the stuff was in my head and that they didn't actually think negatively of me, about me. They were just really, really busy. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. We can uh, improve the way that we handle remote workers, sure. Um, but what I'm trying to urge for you today is uh, to show a degree of care with your teammates. Working in tech is very, very stressful. Um, we're all drowning in endless torrents of requests and features which need to get fixed or built. Uh, you have to move fast and any breakages can cause major financial repercussions. Uh, so try not make people feel shit because it's already stressful. Um, make them feel great. And not only that, uh, help them improve others because I believe that, you know, 
if you help fix the technical, uh, the, the, the culture tech debt, um, you, you get to improve the whole team much faster. Uh, there's a quote by Aristotle which is, uh, the, the, the whole <laughs> is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, so it's, it's much more efficient than to have like a, a, you know, a team that's not just one person that's doing extremely well, but rather bring up everybody else. Um, and that reminds me of something that Flavio brought up, the first speaker. He's talked about time uh, being the most important currency. So uh, try and take the time to really invest in the people around you, because that's all we really have. And that's why my team is important to me, is because those are the people I spend most of the, my time um, with. And so uh, coming to the office and reducing my anxiety and having a great team is what motivates me uh, to work my ass off far more than money. And uh, you, know, you may never know how much it means to your teammates. Uh, you may never get to experience how much they would do for you in return or how far they would fly to eat sandwiches with you. Thank you very much. All right, so next up is our last lightning talk speaker, uh, Marlene. Oh, two, uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, did, did my schedule, is this out of date? I think I have an old copy of this. Yes, I do have an old copy of this. Matthew French, um, talking about grid computing on a budget or reinventing salary. Hello. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew French, and I'm here to talk to you about a little project that I worked on to solve a problem that we have. Um, first, some housekeeping. Sorry, I know everyone seems to do this. I've got to pay the rent. Uh, I was uh, my trip here from Johannesburg was paid for by the company. The company is called FIS. We're in financial services. We have lots of employees. Uh, we have lots of customers, and we're in lots of countries. Um, uh, Yes, for those of you that know, I am actually a wunch. Does anyone know what a wunch is? It's a collective noun for bankers. A wunch of bankers. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the application that I'm working on is called Front Arena. Uh, it's written in C++, but to extend it and customize it, it uses a Python uh, framework which is embedded into the application, which is really nice because we get to use Python. Uh, unfortunately, the downside is we can't do all the Python things we'd like to do, which is kind of what this talk is about today. The problem we had is we had a large, long-running uh, admin process. It would take over eight hours. Uh, actually, it would sometimes take over 36 hours to finish. So we need to break this up and put it into small pieces. Yeah? Uh, the problem is that we're running inside a, um, a Python-friendly, but it's a proprietary environment. So we can't do things like use Celery or, or use many other tools that we're accustomed to, RabbitMQ, for example, installing that and getting set up will be a problem. Yeah? Um, the cultural issues with working with banks, uh, banks, uh, you know, if you have a new software for the last, uh, the software hasn't been around for 10 years, then it's considered maybe a bit newfangled. They don't really want to look at it. So that can be a bit of an issue. And uh, a new feature in, in banks especially is change control boards, where you can't change anything unless you've filled in forms and quadruplicates and then been through three or four forums to tell people you can change things. So when you add in custom software, uh, it gets a bit tricky. You've got to do a lot of extra legwork. So the solution, far too often, is to actually just roll your own software. And that's what I ended up having to do in this case. All right. We had other requirements. Uh, the process we're running had a long startup time. Um, it wasn't actually that long. It was about 15 seconds. But when you're doing this 10,000 times, that 15 seconds adds up. So we needed a process that would uh, run continuously and essentially accept messages. Yeah, um, they also need to be in different si different OS processes because the C++ code and Python, because the global interpreter lock, you can't really do multi-processing concurrent multi-processing in the same uh, process. So you actually needed to have separate tasks. Uh, this next one's a bit of an oxymoron. We needed persistent temporary objects. Uh, <laughs> the application uh, requires some database config to be done for the process. That config is undone at the end, but you don't have to do it every single time you ran it. So you also need to have some features where you could keep an object around for the duration of your task and then delete it at the end. 
Right. Uh, you need to also be able to pause and cancel the process. If it runs over, we need to be able to stop it at a defined point. We don't want it to just die suddenly and leave us in an inconsistent state. So we want to be able to just wind back the process. Uh, we want the ability to rerun failed processes. Um, we also like the ability to pre-generate the work queue. We have dev and test environments with all the work that we want to do in them. Uh, we can generate the work that we want to do from there without having to do it in production, copy the queue to production, and run it on production. It's just like a mega batch script, if you want to think of it like that. Okay, and another feature that we needed was just to have checkpoints because some tasks had to wait for other tasks to finish. So there had to be a point where all the previous tasks had to finish first. So this is some extra features that you wouldn't normally get in a standard process. All right, very quickly, because uh, I see my time is running out. Um, the, the way we implemented it was, uh, it's actually just a simple file-based system. You put your uh, messages, which are stored as JSON, into a directory, a messages directory. Uh, you have generators that can generate those messages for you. You then have workers that read those messages out of the, the queue. Now, if you know anything about uh, concurrency, you'll know that things like mutexes are, are a problem. You need to make sure that two things don't try and read the same task at the same time. So the way I got around this is by moving the file into the workers directory and then checking to see if the file was there. If the file hadn't moved, we know some other process had grabbed it. And so it actually supports concurrency and you don't have problems with trying to run the same task multiple times. Okay, and then just before something gets thrown at me, there's some code. Okay, no time to read it, sorry. And there's some more code. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, so now we have our last speaker, um, Marlene who's going to talk about the PSF and Python in Africa. Ah, is that working? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marlene and uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about the PSF. I'm actually on the board of directors for the PSF really recently. I just got voted in, which is very exciting for me, also very <laughs> nerve-wracking. It's very nerve-wracking, so very cool. Um, a little bit about the PSF. We are a non-profit organization based in the United States and the PSF holds the IP rights that are behind uh, Python. Also, the PSF is the organization that runs the annual PyCon USA, which is actually going to be next year in May. If any of you guys would actually like to speak at PyCon USA, the CFP is actually open right now. You can sign up for that, I think, on PyCon.org, and I would encourage you to, to do that. It's in Ohio. I'm not sure if that's very exciting, but it is. Um, the mission of the, of the PSF is to promote, protect, and advance the Python programming language and to support and facilitate the growth of a diverse and international community of Python programmers. So the PSF really, really tries to encourage different communities in different parts of the world to start using uh, Python. And the different ways they do that, the first thing they do is they protect the intellectual property. So they, that's through uh, things like trademarks, making sure that uh, the PSF logo is being used for the right things and that the word is associated. So whenever someone says Python, uh, when it's in relation to computer programming, it belongs to the PSF. So it protects that. Another thing is membership. So if any of you, if you use Python at all, which I'm assuming you do because you're here, uh, you should, I would encourage you all to sign up as a member. You can do that at python.org. And this way you just show that you're encouraging the growth of the community, that you support the PSA in general. And the third thing is through money. Um, you can actually apply for grants directly to the PSF. It's all, uh, the money is donated. And so you are able to maybe, we also sponsor things like conferences. So this conference was spo sponsored by the PSF as well. And things like user groups and workshops um, are also sponsored. So if you go to python.org, you can actually apply for a grant for some of the things you're working on. So in relation to Africa, the way the PSF, I would, the PSF monitors the growth of different communities 
uh, using the Python language is through maybe seeing which communities are actually requesting grants in order to host things like workshops and events and user groups. So the first time the PSF actually got a request from Africa was in 2010, and that was from South Africa. And uh, PyCon Zere is actually one of the, is, is the longest running uh, PyCon in Africa, and it's actually one of the longest running in the world. So yay PyCon Zere, this is really good. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, then in 2015, that was the next, no, in 2014, that was the next time uh, the, that was the second time uh, the PSF got a grant request from Africa, and this was from uh, a community in Namibia, and they partnered with uh, a group from Cardiff University to host the first ever PyCon Namibia, and from that actually came uh, PyCon Zimbabwe and PyCon Nigeria that requested for grants in 2015. If you want specific statistics on that, you can actually visit the PSF's blog, which is pyfound.blogspot.com, uh, so currently, at the moment, we only have about 15 countries in Africa locally that are using, uh, that are actively, you know, hosting user groups or workshops or running uh, PyCons. If you can notice, the top and the middle, so Central Africa and also North Africa don't have much activity. Um, I actually am trying to see if we can sort of encourage a community and growth in uh, places like Egypt and, uh, and Morocco, but the issue sometimes is the language barrier. So if any of you happen to speak Arabic, uh, let me know. I am looking for Arabic speakers. Uh, but we really want to encourage the growth of, Py uh, of the Python community across Africa. Um, and the ways that you guys can actually participate in doing that, uh, there's several ways to do that. The first thing is supporting new conferences. So PyCon Ghana is actually hosting their first ever PyCon next year. I would encourage you guys to go and speak there or to attend uh, or follow their uh, Twitter page. The next thing you can do is sign up for uh, helping to organize regional conferences. There's a DjangoCon that's being organized, DjangoCon Africa, so I would encourage you to do that. And then the third thing is become part of the community. So whether that's mentoring or um, becoming a member or just attending conferences. That's what you can do. And that is the end of the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>